I believe entrepreneurial thinking can change the world. Over the course of the past 12 years, starting, growing and managing companies and working internationally on entrepreneurship, I've discovered a four-stage process that defines entrepreneurship, which it simultaneously enhances and is driven by seven mindsets. Now, it starts by identifying a problem. Humankind today is younger than it's ever been. Half the world's population right now is under the age of 25, and there's a crisis coming. It's a crisis that the world's leaders in government, business, charities, and especially youth all agree on. That crisis is youth unemployment. There, are, uh, there is currently a bulge of 1.8 billion youth in the world right now. 90% of them live in developing countries, and two-thirds of them are underutilized, so they're not in formal education or employment. The youth unemployment crisis is coming. And I'd like to propose that it has serious social, economic, political, and systemic implications. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, that does, that's not relevant to me. And by virtue of the fact that you're sitting here and you're privileged enough to be watching this talk, you might be right. But let's take the EU, for example. From 2008 to 2012, youth unemployment increased by 24.9%. Now, you may also be thinking, sitting there thinking, well, this guy sounds Australian. Australia's a lucky country, right? Well, even in one of the most robust economies in the world, one in four Australians aged between 15 and 24 are not in permanent education or employment right now. This youth unemployment crisis is coming, and we need to address it now. And my proposal is that entrepreneurial thinking is a solution to this problem. So what is entrepreneurial thinking? It starts by identifying a problem, creating a sustainable commercial solution to that problem, figuring out who values it, so who's your target market, then taking action, and it continues. That is simultaneously, it simultaneously enhances and is driven by these seven mindsets, which I'll explain to you now. The first mindset is being passionate, inspired, and energetic. Confucius said, choose a job that you love, and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Is being empowered and confident enough to identify and take opportunities. Amy Hempel said, there's no such thing as luck. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. T.S. Eliot said, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. The next mindset is that of leadership. John C. Maxwell said, leadership is taking responsibility whilst others are making excuses. The next mindset is being disciplined and hardworking. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. It's one of my favorites. The final mindset is that of constantly learning being adaptive and dynamic. And Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. So what I'd like to propose is that this concept of entrepreneurial thinking has the power to change the world in two fundamental ways. The first is the fact that when you create an ecosystem that where this concept can foster, you can lift societies out of poverty. By definition, when you can make people financially sustainable, they're no longer afflicted by extreme poverty or hunger. 
that can afford basic services. The second way is that this concept of entrepreneurial thinking has the ability to fundamentally change the way the world thinks. Because when you think like this, you approach your everyday actions, your thoughts and your emotions with an elevated state. Entrepreneurial thinking can change the world. Now, I'd like to tell you a little story about a stupid kid from a privileged upbringing that stumbled across this concept. When I left school, I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur meant. I loved helping people, and I loved helping people one-on-one, -on -one, so I thought, I'm going to go and study psychology. So I went to Sydney Uni and started a psych degree, and I loved it. What I loved more was nightclubs. <laughs> so I thought, hey, they're way more fun. I'm going to go and do that. And about a year and a half into my degree, I dropped out and I found myself arrested with drug-induced psychosis, checking myself into rehab. And I ended up in front of a guy called John Anderson, who was a psychopharmacologist. Bit of a mouthful. John changed my life in a quite a few ways. First of all, he got me back on the straight and narrow. So, I was no longer running around like a loony tune. And then he got diagnosed with bone cancer. And he only had a few months to live. And he kept seeing his patients up until a month before he died. And he sat me down, the last time I ever saw him, and he said, Jeremy, if you can take one thing away from our time together, let it be this. That if you can honestly look back on your life and tell yourself that you've made every step count, then you'll die a happy man. And ever since that day, I've done my best to make sure every step does. So I left, this, I left this office with this new philosophy on life. I'm going to make every step count. I'm going to change the world. I'm a 19-year-old kid working in hospitality. How the hell am I going to do that? I don't know what I'm doing. But anyway, I was, I was determined. I'm going to make every step count. So I'm, I met this guy in a bar, and I'm telling him my philosophy on life. And he goes, hey, you should read this book. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, um, and he gave me a copy, and I thought, okay, cool, this, this is an interesting concept. This was a book about a poor dad that had worked for, for a salary his entire life, and his somewhat adopted rich dad, who built, and, built companies and sold them. And I flicked the switch in my head. I thought, right, entrepreneurship, I get it, this is what I want to do. I can make every step count. I can build companies and, and build wealth. But how am I going to change the world? I like helping people. So at the same time, I used to be very philanthropic. I'd give lots of money away. Someone came up to me on the street, you know, those guys with clipboards, and be like, hey, you want to save the dolphins? I'd be like, yeah, awesome. Sign me up. And then someone else would come up, and, you know, five minutes later, and be like, hey, you want to save this kid in Africa? So I'd be like, yeah, great, sign me up. I'm a 19-year-old kid working in hospitality. I didn't have a lot of money. And then I end up with about that much money in my bank account. And my mum sits me down and she's like, Jeremy, if you want to help people, you kind of need to be able to eat. And so, again, a rather profound moment, I, I thought, okay, well, I want to make every step count and, and change the world. I've got, I can build companies that create wealth and I can use that wealth to do really cool stuff. I can have, do, have a positive impact on the world with the money that I generate through business. So I, I kind of I thought I'd figured it out. 19 years old, I figured everything out, right? <laughs> and so I'm off, and I'm, I'm thinking, all right, how am I going to do this? So my brother Cameron comes to me at the time, and he says, hey, 
Jeremy, why don't you go and study a Bachelor of Business Studies, learn a bit about business. I'm going to open up a juice bar, you can manage it. So I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I, I, sounds like fun, I'll do that. And that juice bar from the, the day we opened the doors was a $1.2 million business. It did, did very well. And, and we opened a couple more, which didn't do so well. Um, but I got asked to go to Singapore just before my 22nd birthday and run a master franchise of the juice bars there. Again, complete disaster, but that's not the talk. And then one day, this guy from school called Andrew McIver walks into my office in Singapore. He'd heard that I was working in juice bars. And he's, and he's like, Jeremy, I've got this idea for a business. We're going to sell berries from the Amazon in juice bars in Australia. <laughs> I'm like, you're crazy. Um, I can't even pronounce these things. He's like, yeah, acai berries from the Amazon. And I'm like, well, all right, I'll try, you know, I'll try some. Let's, let's try some. So I tried them and they were amazing in this frozen, in this frozen sorbet. But what was really cool about the acai industry is that it operates on this triple bottom line principle, people, planet, and profit. So acai is good for the people where it's harvested because it operates on fair trade principles. Everyone gets a fair split of the money. It's a free market. It's also good for the people that we sell it to because it's really healthy. It's good for the planet because it's a Greenpeace endorsed industry. So because it's wild harvested in the Amazon, by growing demand for the product, we actually taught the locals to look after this area so they weren't chopping it down and using it for agriculture or other forms of you know, palm oil or whatever. And there was the opportunity to make a profit out of it. Now remember those 100 kids in, in the school? Here's a really cool thing about real life. We started donating to a charity so we kept 1% of our revenue. And we put 100 kids through school for a period of time. Paid for everything, their teachers, their, their books, their food, their clothes. Kept the whole school running. And I got to go and visit these kids. And that was one of the most incredible, in fact, the most incredible experience I've ever had. It was amazing. I'd finally figured out how I could use a business to really do something good. And it's, it's just an amazing experience. And if real life fell over tomorrow, thankfully I don't think it will, but if it did, I could still look back at that experience and just be like, wow, I, you know, I really did something. Now, real life's been going for eight years now. It, about six years into it, I started to get Itchy feet, itchy feet, like many entrepreneurs, and I decided I wanted to have a more leveraged impact. So I started mentoring and coaching, and just donating my time. I wrote a book which hopefully inspires people to start company, companies and can teach them something as well. And then I stumbled across the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance. Now, I looked at this website and I was like, wow, here's a not-for-profit which is the representative body for young entrepreneurs in each of the G20 countries. They hold a summit every year where they talk to the G20 leaders, so the prime ministers and presidents of these countries, about why youth entrepreneurship could solve some of the problems that they're trying to solve. Guess what one of the major problems is around the world that everyone agrees on? Youth unemployment. So. What we believe here is that new business creation creates more jobs. More jobs means less unemployment. But more than that, we've got the opportunity to create social enterprise that can actually go and solve problems in third world countries. And there's things like microfinance that can address issues in developing countries as well. So I got asked to go to Mexico and take lead the delegation over there last year. I was in Russia this year. Next year, we host the summit here in Sydney. And so there'll be around 500 of the world's top young entrepreneurial brains coming to Sydney. And what we're going to be doing is building an action plan on youth unemployment. It's all nice and well to sit up and, and talk about problems. I, I want to create a solution, I think like an entrepreneur. So we'll, we're going to create this action plan on youth unemployment. Now through my work at the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance, I got introduced to the United Nations Millennium Campaign. 
and this is where it got really interesting. In 2000, Kofi Annan got the world to agree on identifying and quantifying a 15-year plan on addressing the major humanitarian and sustainability issues in the world, issues like hunger and poverty, and gender equality, child mortality. And so they set 21 goals within these eight major frameworks. In 2015, this is up. The, goal, the, the goals will either have been reached or not. So they're looking at the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals agenda. And the really exciting thing here is that the guys at the Millennium Campaign totally get it. They get that entrepreneurial thinking can change the world. They understand that by addressing youth unemployment with this concept, you can address a lot of these issues because when you build people's financial sustainability, they can afford basic services and, and a lot of these problems get solved. So I'd like to give you two examples of how entrepreneurial thinking can change the world. On the left here, we have Mary Grace. She's 32, she lives in the Philippines. And she has three kids. Mary Grace makes basic homewares and sells them. But what she does now through microcredit is gets a loan for $100, which allows her to buy in bulk six months worth of stock. She saves some money by doing that, which allows her to earn an extra $1.50 a day. With that $1.50 a day, she can put her kids through school. On the right, you've got Mary Ann. Now, Mary Ann started out like Mary Grace, but what she now does is travels around the Philippines teaching financial literacy and entrepreneurial skills to people like Mary Grace. And there's 10,000 Mary Anns around the Philippines right now, and that's just the Philippines that have been inspired by this concept of entrepreneurial thinking to the point where they want to influence everyone else. Entrepreneurial thinking can change the world. So I hope now that you've seen how entrepreneurial thinking changed my life, how it changed the life of 100 children in the Amazon, and how it can change the world. And I'd like to leave you with a question and a challenge. How are you going to use entrepreneurial thinking to make every step count? And what problem can you solve that will change the world? Thank you.